reminiscences of margaret fuller by ralph waldo emerson from memoirs of margaret fuller osoli this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reminiscences of margaret fuller she was an active inspiring companion and correspondent and all the art the thought and the nobleness in new england seemed at that moment related to her and she to it she was everywhere a welcome guest the houses of her friends in town and country were open to her and every hospitable attention eagerly offered her arrival was a holiday and so was her abode she stayed a few days often a week more seldom a month and all tasks that could be suspended were put aside to catch the favourable hour in walking riding or boating to talk with this joyful guest who brought wit anecdotes love stories tragedies oracles with her and with her broad web of relations to so many fine friends seemed like the queen of some parliament of love who carried the key to all confidences and to whom every question had been finally referred persons were her game specially if marked by fortune or character or success to such was she sent she addressed them with a hardihood almost a haughty assurance queen-like indeed they fell in her way where the access might have seemed difficult by wonderful casualties and the inveterate recluse the coyest maid the waywardest poet made no resistance but yielded at discretion as if they had been waiting for her all doors to this imperious dame she disarmed the suspicion of recluse scholars by the absence of bookishness the ease with which she entered into conversation made them forget all they had heard of her and she was infinitely less interested in literature than in life they saw she valued earnest persons and dante petrarch and goethe because they thought as she did and gratified her with high portraits which she was everywhere seeking she drew her companions to surprising confessions she was the wedding guest to whom the long-pent story must be told and they were not less struck on reflection at the suddenness of the friendship which had established in one day new and permanent covenants she extorted the secret of life which cannot be told without setting heart and mind in a glow and thus had the best of those she saw whatever romance whatever virtue whatever impressive experience this came to her and she lived in a superior circle for they suppressed all their commonplace in her presence she was perfectly true to this confidence she never confounded relations but kept a hundred fine threads in her hand without crossing or entangling any an entire intimacy which seemed to make both sharers of the whole horizon of each other's and of all truth did not yet make her false to any other friend gave no title to the history that an equal trust of another friend had put in her keeping in this reticence was no prudery and no effort for so rich her mind that she never was tempted to treachery by the desire of entertaining the day was never long enough to exhaust her opulent memory and i who knew her intimately for ten years from july eighteen thirty six till august eighteen forty six when she sailed for europe never saw her without surprise at her new powers of the conversations above alluded to the substance was whatever was suggested by her passionate wish for equal companions to the end of making life altogether noble with the firmest tact 
she led the discourse into the midst of their daily living and working recognizing the good will and sincerity which each man has in his aims and treating so playfully and intellectually all the points that one seemed to see his life in bow and was flattered by beholding what he had found so tedious in his workday weeds shining in glorious costume each of his friends passed before him in the new light hope seemed to spring under his feet and life was worth living the auditor jumped for joy and thirsted for unlimited draughts what is this the dame who i heard was sneering and critical this the blue stocking of whom i stood in terror and dislike this wondrous woman full of counsel full of tenderness before whom every mean thing is ashamed and hides itself this new corinne more variously gifted wise supportive eloquent who seems to have learned all languages heaven knows when or how i should think she was born to them magnificent prophetic reading my life at her will and puzzling me with riddles like this yours is an example of a destiny springing from character and again i see your destiny hovering before you but it always escapes from you the test of this eloquence was its range it told on children and on old people on men of the world and on sainted maids she could hold them all by her honeyed tongue a lady of the best eminence whom margaret occasionally visited in one of our cities of spindles speaking one day of her neighbors said i stand in a certain awe of the moneyed men the manufacturers and so on knowing that they will have small interest in plato or in bio but i saw them approach margaret with perfect security for she could give them bread that they could eat some persons are thrown off their balance when in society others are thrown on to balance the excitement of company and the observation of other characters correct their biases margaret always appeared to unexpected advantage in conversation with a large circle she had more sanity than any other whilst in private her vision was often through coloured lenses her talents were so various and her conversation so rich and entertaining that one might talk with her many times by the parlour fire before he discovered the strength which served as foundation to so much accomplishment and eloquence but concealed under flowers and music was the broadest good sense very well able to dispose of all this pile of native and foreign ornaments and quite able to work without them she could always rally on this in every circumstance and in every company and find herself on a firm footing of equality with any party whatever and make herself useful and if need be formidable the old anaximenes seeking i suppose for a source sufficiently diffusive said that mind must be in the air which when all men breathed they were filled with one intelligence and when men have larger measures of reason as aesop cervantes franklin scott they gain in universality or are no longer confined to a few associates but are good company for all persons philosophers women men of fashion tradesmen and servants indeed an older philosopher than anaximenes namely language itself had taught to distinguish superior or purer sense as common sense margaret had with certain limitations or must we say strictures these larger lungs inhaling this universal element 
and could speak to jew and greek free and bond to each in his own tongue the concord stage coachman distinguished her by his respect and the chambermaid was pretty sure to confide to her on the second day her homely romance i regret that it is not in my power to give any true report of margaret's conversation she soon became an established friend and frequent inmate of our house and continued thenceforward for years to come once in three or four months to spend a week or a fortnight with us she adopted all the people and all the interests she found here your people shall be my people and yonder darling boy i shall cherish as my own her ready sympathies endeared her to my wife and my mother each of whom highly esteemed her good sense and sincerity she suited each and all yet she was not a person to be suspected of complacence and her attachments one might say were chemical she had so many tasks of her own that she was a very easy guest to entertain as she could be left to herself day after day without apology according to our usual habit we seldom met in the forenoon after dinner we read something together or walked or rode in the evening she came to the library and many and many a conversation was there held whose details if they could be preserved would justify all encomiums they interested me in every manner talent memory wit stern introspection poetic play religion the finest personal feeling the aspects of the future each followed each in full activity and left me i remember enriched and sometimes astonished by the gifts of my guest her topics were numerous but the cardinal points of poetry love and religion were never far off she was a student of art and though untravelled knew much better than most persons who had been abroad the conventional reputation of each of the masters she was familiar with all the field of elegant criticism in literature among the problems of the day these two attracted her chiefly mythology and demonology then also french socialism especially as it concerned woman the whole prolific family of reforms and of course the genius and career of each remarkable person she had other friends in this town beside those in my house a lady already alluded to lived in the village who had known her longer than i and whose prejudices margaret had resolutely fought down until she converted her into the firmest and most efficient of friends in eighteen forty two nathaniel hawthorne already then known to the world by his twice told tales came to live in concord in the old manse with his wife who was herself an artist with these welcomed persons margaret formed a strict and happy acquaintance she liked their old house and the taste which had filled it with new articles of beautiful form yet harmonized with the antique furniture left by the former proprietors she liked too the pleasing walks and rides and boatings which that neighborhood commanded in eighteen forty two william ellery channing whose wife was her sister built a house in concord and this circumstance made a new tie and another home for margaret arcana it was soon evident that there was somewhat a little pagan about her that she had some faith more or less distinct in a fate and in a guardian genius that her fancy or her pride had played with her religion she had a taste for gems ciphers talismans omens coincidences and birthdays she had a special love for the planet jupiter 
and a belief that the month of september was inauspicious to her she never forgot that her name margarita signified a pearl when i first met with the name lila she said i knew from the very look and sound it was mine i knew that it meant night night which brings out stars as sorrow brings out truths sortilege she valued she tried sortes biblica and her hits were memorable i think each new book which interested her she was disposed to put to this test and know if it had somewhat personal to say to her as happens to such persons these guesses were justified by the event she chose carbuncle for her own stone and when a dear friend was to give her a gem this was the one selected she valued what she had somewhere read that carbuncles are male and female the female casts out light the male has his within himself mine she said is the male and she was wont to put on her carbuncle a bracelet or some selected gem to write letters to certain friends one of her friends she coupled with the onyx another in a decided way with the amethyst she learned that the ancients esteemed this gem a talisman to dispel intoxication to give good thoughts and understanding the greek meaning is antidote against drunkenness she characterized her friends by these stones and wrote to the last mentioned the following lines to dash slow wandering on a tangled way to their lost child pure spirits say the diamond marshal thee by day by night the carbuncle defend heart's blood of a bosom friend on thy brow the amethyst violet of purest earth when by fullest sunlight kissed best reveals its regal birth and when that hallowed moment flies shall keep thee steadfast chaste and wise coincidences good and bad contretemps seals ciphers mottoes omens anniversaries names dreams are all of a certain importance to her her letters are often dated on some marked anniversary of her own or of her correspondent's calendar she signalized saints days all souls and all saints by poems which had for her a mystical value she remarked a pre-established harmony of the names of her personal friends as well as of her historical favorites that of emmanuel for swedenborg and rosencrantz for the head of the rosicrucians if christian rosencrantz she said is not a maid name the genius of the age interfered in the baptismal rite as in the cases of the archangels of art michael and raphael and in giving the name of emmanuel to the captain of the new jerusalem sub rosa crux i think is the true derivation and not the chemical one generation corruption etc in this spirit she soon surrounded herself with a little mythology of her own she had a series of anniversaries which she kept her seal ring of the flying mercury had its legend she chose the system for her emblem and had it carefully drawn with a view to its being engraved on a gem and i know not how many verses and legends came recommended to her by this symbolism her dreams of course partook of this symmetry the same dream returns to her periodically annually and punctual to its night one dream she marks in her journal as repeated for the fourth time in c i at last distinctly recognized the figure of the early vision 
whom i found after i had left a who led me on the bridge towards the city glittering in sunset but midway the bridge went under water i have often seen in her face that it was she but refused to believe it she valued of course the significance of flowers and chose emblems for her friends from her garden to dash with heart's ease content in purple luster clad kingly serene and golden glad no demi hues of sad contrition no pallors of enforced submission give me such content as this and keep a while the rosy bliss demonology this catching at straws of coincidence where all is geometrical seems the necessity of certain natures it is true that in every good work the particulars are right and that every spot of light on the ground under the trees is a perfect image of the sun yet for astronomical purposes an observatory is better than an orchard and in a universe which is nothing but generations or an unbroken suite of cause and effect to infer providence because a man happens to find a shilling on the pavement just when he wants one to spend is puerile and much as if each of us should date his letters and notes of hand from his own birthday instead of from christ's or the king's reign or the current congress these to be sure are also at first petty and private beginnings but by the world of men clothed with a social and comical character it will be seen however that this propensity margaret held with certain tenets of fate which always swayed her and which goethe who had found room and fine names for all this in his system had encouraged and i may add which her own experiences early and late seemed strangely to justify some extracts from her letters to different persons will show how this matter lay in her mind to ralph waldo emerson december twelfth eighteen forty three when goethe received a letter from zelter with a handsome superscription he said lay that aside it is zelter's true handwriting every man has a demon who is busy to confuse and limit his life no way is the action of this power more clearly shown than in the handwriting on this occasion the evil influences have been evaded the mood the hand the pen and paper have conspired to let our friend write truly himself you may perceive i quote from memory as the sentences are anything but gertian but i think often of this little passage with me for weeks and months the demon works his will nothing succeeds with me i fall ill or am otherwise interrupted at these times whether of frost or sultry weather i would gladly neither plant nor reap wait for the better times which sometimes come when i forget that sickness is ever possible when all interruptions are upborne like straws on the full stream of my life and the words that accompany it are as much in harmony as sedges murmuring near the bank not all yet not unlike but it often happens that something presents itself and must be done in the bad time nothing presents itself in the good so i like the others seem worse and poorer than i am in another letter to an earlier friend she expiates a little as to the demonical i know not that i can say to you anything more precise than you find from goethe there are no precise terms for such thoughts the word instinctive indicates their existence 
i intimated it in the little piece on the drachenfels it may be best understood perhaps by a symbol as the sun shines from the serene heavens dispelling noxious exhalations and calling forth exquisite thoughts on the surface of earth in the shape of shrub or flower so gnome-like works the fire within the hidden caverns and secret veins of earth fashioning existences which have a longer share in time perhaps because they are not immortal in thought love beauty wisdom goodness are intelligent but this power moves only to seize its prey it is not necessarily either malignant or the reverse but it has no scope beyond demonstrating its existence when conscious self-asserting it becomes as power working for its own sake unwilling to acknowledge love for its superior must the devil that is the legend of lucifer the star that would not own its centre yet while it is unconscious it is not devilish only demonic in nature we trace it in all volcanic workings in a boding position of lights in whispers of the wind which has no pedigree in deceitful invitations of the water in the sullen rock which never shall find a voice and in the shapes of all those beings who go about seeking what they may devour we speak of a mystery a dread we shudder but we approach still nearer and a part of our nature listens sometimes answers to this influence which if not indestructible is at least indissolubly linked with the existence of matter in genius and in character it works as you say instinctively it refuses to be analyzed by the understanding and is most of all inaccessible to the person who possesses it we can only say i have it he has it you have seen it often in the eyes of those italian faces you like it is most obvious in the eye as we look on such eyes we think on the tiger the serpent beings who lurk glide fascinate mysteriously control for it is occult by its nature and if it could meet you on the highway and be familiarly known as an acquaintance could not exist the angels of light do not love yet they do not insist on exterminating it it has given rise to the fables of wizard enchantress and the like these beings are scarcely good yet not necessarily bad power tempts them they draw their skills from the dead because their being is coeval with that of matter and matter is the mother of death in later days she allowed herself sometimes to dwell sadly on the resistances which she called her fate and remarked that all life that has been or could be natural to me is invariably denied she wrote long afterwards my days at milan were not unmarked i have known some happy hours but they all led to sorrow and not only the cups of wine but of milk seemed drugged with poison for me it does not seem to be my fault this destiny i do not court these things they come i am a poor magnet with power to be wounded by the bodies i attract temperament i said that margaret had a broad good sense which brought her near to all people i am to say that she had also a strong temperament which is that counter force which makes individuality by driving all the powers in the direction of the ruling thought or feeling and when it is allowed full sway isolating them these two tendencies were always invading each other and now one and now the other carried the day this alternation perplexes the biographer as it did the observer 
we contradict on the second page what we affirm on the first and i remember how often i was compelled to correct my impressions of her character when living for after i had settled it once for all that she wanted this or that perception at our next interview she would say with emphasis the very word i think in her case there was something abnormal in those obscure habits and necessities which we denote by the word temperament in the first days of our acquaintance i felt her to be a foreigner that with her one would always be sensible of some barrier as if in making up a friendship with a cultivated spaniard or turk she had a strong constitution and of course its reactions were strong and this is the reason why in all her life she has so much to say of her fate she was in jubilant spirits in the morning and ended the day with nervous headache whose spasms my wife told me produced total prostration she had great energy of speech and action and seemed formed for high emergencies her life concentrated itself on certain happy days happy hours happy moments the rest was a void she had read that a man of letters must lose many days to work well in one much more must a sappho or a sibyl the capacity of pleasure was balanced by the capacity of pain if i had whist she writes i am a worse self-tormentor than rousseau and all my riches are fuel to the fire my beautiful lore like the tropic clime hatches scorpions to sting me there is a verse which annie of lochroyan sings about her ring that torments my memory tis so true of myself when i found she lived at a rate so much faster than mine and which was violent compared with mine i foreboded rash and painful crises and had a feeling as if a voice cried stand from under as if a little further on this destiny was threatened with jars and reverses which no friendship could avert or console this feeling partly wore off on better acquaintance but remained latent and i had always an impression that her energy was too much a force of blood and therefore never felt the security for her peace which belongs to more purely intellectual natures she seemed more vulnerable for the same reason she remained inscrutable to me her strength was not my strength her powers were a surprise she passed into new states of great advance but i understood these no better it were long to tell her peculiarities her childhood was full of presentiments she was then a somnambulist she was subject to attacks of delirium and later perceived that she had spectral illusions when she was twelve she had a determination of blood to the head my parents she said were much mortified to see the fineness of my complexion destroyed my own vanity was for a time severely wounded but i recovered and made up my mind to be bright and ugly she was all her lifetime the victim of disease and pain she read and wrote in bed and believed that she could understand anything better when she was ill pain acted like a girdle to give tension to her powers a lady who was with her one day during a terrible attack of nervous headache which made margaret totally helpless assured me that margaret was yet in the finest vein of humour and kept those who were assisting her in a strange painful excitement between laughing and crying by perpetual brilliant sallies there were other peculiarities of habit and power when she turned her head on one side she alleged she had second sight like 
St. Francis. These traits or predispositions made her a willing listener to all the uncertain science of mesmerism and its goblin brood, which had been rife in recent years. She had a feeling that she ought to have been a man, and said of herself, a man's ambition with a woman's heart is an evil lot. In some verses which she wrote, to the moon, occur these lines. But if I steadfast gaze upon thy face, a human secret like my own I trace, for through the woman's smile looks the male eye. And she found something of true portraiture in a disagreeable novel of Balzac's, Le Livre Mystique, in which an equivocal figure exerts alternately a masculine and a feminine influence on the characters of the plot. End of Reminiscences of Margaret Fuller by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson The Sea and Conrad by William McPhee This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard the sea and conrad by william mcphee it was francis grierson some ten years ago in a brief article in the new age who first called attention to the very remarkable qualities of a book called the nigger of the narcissus just then published by heinemann at a shilling it was a slim scarlet easily held book designed to read in bed pack in a grip lend to a friend or slip in the pocket against a rail journey in the middle of the day when the morning paper had been read and the evening journals were not yet on the stands it may have been by design that this article came out just at that moment for heinemann was an admirable tactician bad literature was abhorrent to him as may be seen by the books bearing his imprimatur but he doubtless saw no reason why a man who published fine books should not let it get about or should refrain from mentioning it in a friendly way it may be remarked that a number of english publishers at that time were in the habit of issuing books in a manner that can only be described as virtuously surreptitious they did good by stealth it would not do to say that any house ever published a book without informing its shipping department but it amounted to that in the long run mr heinemann was not that sort of publisher francis grierson's article appeared in the new age the slim red book appeared in the bookstores and a new light shone before the present writer for the first time in his life he became aware of the existence of a writer named conrad it was an extraordinary experience it was also a very chastening one for the present writer had not only written but published a book of his own dealing with the sea and with seamen he had grown up in a genuine tradition of the mercantile marine sea captains had been so close to him all his life that he accepted them as part of the surrounding landscape a long period of literary and artistic gestation in chelsea had somewhat alienated him from the rich humanity of his seafaring relatives and here in the nigger of the narcissus he found them again transfigured to heroic dimensions like the sombre and enormous shadows of grown-ups on the nursery wall it was in glasgow on an evening in late summer that the present writer walked along sociahall street and turning down radnor and finiston streets entered the queen's dock where his ship lay the nigger of the narcissus was under his arm the rays of the setting sun still threw a twilight and roseate glamour over the interminable ridge of the hills of old kilpatrick and with the story of the nigger yet vibrating in his brain he made his way up the gangway and descended the short ladder to the iron deck of the elderly freighter it is not too much to say that he regarded her shapely old hull 
and comfortable quarters with profound affection built some fifteen years before for the nine knot australian trade she was now relegated to the shorter voyages to the mediterranean we had been a long time together commander mates engineers including the donkeyman the carpenter and the engine storekeeper the last three were much more like the characters in a dream play than quick active seamen the document was a turk and lived in a sort of solitary and immaculate retirement in a three-cornered cabin in the forecastle the carpenter was a norwegian and haunted the stirring house aft where he shut himself up and fashioned models of fabulous sailing ships the storekeeper who owned to the entirely inadequate name of frank freshwater was a willing and diminutive englishman with a large nose and an immense military moustache he was known to speak both donkeyman and chips and in fact may have been created for the sole purpose of communicating between them but even that degree of loquacity dried up on nearing glasgow he was the sad proprietor of a ferocious virago who would appear on the quay with miraculous promptitude the moment the gangway slid over and wait relentlessly for him to appear he never did appear it is necessary to add the whole ship's company became enthusiastic sporting accessories to the fact of poor old freshwater's unobtrusive escape while some hardened married man goaded the virago to paroxysms of absurd rage until the dock policeman walked stolidly in our direction preening his moustache and the principal bond between all of us there on that ship was a very honest liking for the chief the turk once said to the present writer who was second engineer at the time the chief he is my fazer and was so prostrated with that display of dramatic and emotional volubility that he did not speak again for a fortnight unless he talked to himself to frank freshwater the chief presented another and equally admirable facet one of the truest men who ever stood in shoe leather frank's estimate is quoted because it was a very accurate description the chief was just that and as the present writer came aboard with the nigger of the narcissus under his arm he beheld the burly form of the chief standing by the door of the port alleyway stripped to the waist his large pale hairy arms folded his bosom screened from view by his patriarchal beard smoking a cigarette in the end of a long black holder well said he taking the holder from his lips and looking down at the great curve of his abdomen did you have a good time simple words expressing a simple kindly consideration yet by virtue of the magical tale just read the present writer saw those words in a new and enchanting light he saw perhaps for the first time in his literary life the true function of dialogue as a resonant and plangent element through which the forms and characters of men can be projected upon the retina of the reader he became aware of a more subtle music in the very shape and timbre of the long familiar phrases and behind the amiable superior and valuable shipmate he suddenly saw that quiet attentive bearded man as a character in a book the unconscious victim of a future work of art this is a great stride in life to get behind the switchboard as one may say and see even for a brief illuminating moment the various resistances and insulations the connection to earth without which one's impact upon humanity is a floating foolish pose the author who does this for you is forever memorable quite apart from his intrinsic value to the public i said yes i had a good time and i added with a curious feeling of diffident exultation i have a book here i would like you to read it seems to me rather good he took it and at once made that faint and somewhat vague gesture which invariably accompanied a gentle murmur of apology about his glasses turning to the low door leading to his room we passed in there was no dynamo on that ship and a study lamp with a brown shade stood on a little desk by the settee adjusting a pair of spectacles on his nose the chief opened the book and began to read the title page 
he stood there a remarkable nude figure with his shining bald head and venerable beard holding the volume at arm's length and looking down through his glasses with severe attention the first page and the second were read and turned and he never moved so i left him and went round to my cabin on the starboard side the ship was moving under the coal tips early next morning and it was due to this that some time after midnight i was still about and noticed the light still burning in his room i went in he was standing there turning the last immortal pages he had put on an old patrol coat and had buttoned it absently over his beard i have often thought that conrad must have met him somewhere he is so exactly presented in part of darkness as the amiable engineer of the river-boat who put his beard in a bag to keep it clean the discerning will recall that person's bald head whose hair conrad whimsically observes had fallen to his chin where it had prospered he lowered his head and looked at me over his glasses as i made some professional remark and laid the book down a funny thing he observed in his quite precise voice this nigger says a girl chucked the third engineer of a rennie boat for him he stroked his beard with a broad powerful palm you know i was third of a rennie boat in my young days he meditated for a moment and added that book makes you feel somehow a notable reflection and as time went on it became a habit of the present writer to experiment on his shipmates by noting their reactions to the works of conrad the point to remember is that neglecting certain easily explained failures men reacted in direct ratio to their integrity of character the cunning the avaricious and the ignoble are not admirers of conrad there is something in the style and the spirit which reaches surely and inexorably down into a man's moral resources and sounds them for him to those who in the jargon of the red-blooded fraternity want a story it is to be feared our author does not appeal this was exemplified by typhoon which was tried upon a naval reserve officer a brisk efficient resourceful young man with an acute examination brain his criticism was brief and emphatic you could write the whole story on a couple of sheets of foolscap he grumbled there's nothing to it too far-fetched as well he shut the book with a sudden closing of fingers and thumb and passed it back promptly forgetting the whole affair he is neither cunning avaricious nor ignoble but he is afflicted with the modern conception of efficiency for him romance lies in the past of highwaymen knights in shining armor and machiavellian cardinals of inconceivable obliquity to a writer who has indulged his humor by watching seafaring folk in their reactions as mentioned above these collected prefaces which conrad has written for the sundial edition of his works under the title of notes on my books have a very special interest they tell with a direct and disarming candor the authentic origin of the tales the troublesome enthusiast who is forever seeking the fiction which is founded on fact will get small comfort here for here are the facts it is the penalty of success in the fictional art to illumine the obscure experiences of worthy members of the public and convince them that such and such an affair actually happened these folks are very timid at trying their wings they dread leaving the solid earth behind it is a positive comfort to them to feel that the things which have touched their hearts are only the bright shadows of the hard actualities under their feet the chief engineer to whom i presented lord jim not the beloved and bearded personality described above was an interesting variant of this a hard-bitten portly individual an excellent officer and well read withal he deprecated in its entirety the conradian philosophy and literary method yes he knew the story out east as did everybody else a ship called the jetta it was which ran over a sunken derelict and broke her back the officers left her who wouldn't a million chances to one against her lasting ten minutes conrad had idealized the mate jim that was all 
that was the word he used idealized he was a blunt englishman with his emotions planted almost inaccessibly deep down among his racial prejudices he objected really to anybody's discussing the fundamental motives of man it was not the thing to do possibly the slight imponderable irony which almost always creeps into conrad's descriptions of sea-going engineers was responsible for my friend's irritation leaving out the worthy solomon rot and typhoon conrad seems to have been something less than fortunate in his engineer types at the other end of the scale the present writer preserves a most lively memory of his introduction to youth by the third mate of a beef ship running into london river an alert and cheerful college boy who had been through the hard grueling of an apprenticeship in sale he was at that stage of the twenties when one is equally interesting to the women of thirty the men of forty and the mothers of fifty and it was he who as we were passing the watch below in friendly comparison of books read suddenly lighted up all over his fresh ruddy features and said in a glow of delicious enthusiasm i say haven't you read youth my work but you must read youth it's ripping the finest tale i ever read in my life and he stuck to it in spite of anything the others might say he had been caught by the extraordinary glamour of the thing the superb simplicity of the narrative the cumulative power of the finale he would never be the same being again after reading that tale here we have an achievement for which there is no adequate name save genius other books there are of conrad's which enshrine no memories of a shipmate's admiration or dislike there is nostromo for instance that little red masterpiece of creative literature ordered from london during the war and read while voyaging between port said and saloniki this tale of a seaboard made the monotonous business of naval transport seem a dim and ridiculous fragment of unreality the huge size of the canvas the sweep and surge of the narrative the sudden revealing phrases the balanced cadence of the sentences the single heart notes calling to some obscure emotion of the soul all these made their appeal and created an imperishable memory and there is a point it is pertinent to make here in view of this new volume of notes on life and letters that is doing conrad a disservice to characterize him as a sea writer one does not call turner a sea painter the highest genius does not shackle itself with such very trivial restrictions some of the finest of conrad's tales have nothing whatever to do with the sea notably heart of darkness under western eyes and an outcast of the islands if it be not misunderstood the present writer would like to say that going to sea will have had very little influence upon the final verdict of posterity upon conrad's work his philosophy is his own and fundamentally antagonistic to the ideas of most seafarers his technical method is provoking to seamen who have a very different fashion of telling a tale as different in fact as the average shipmaster is from charlie marlowe there is as conrad himself remarks nothing speculative in a sailor's mentality the meaning of his story is on the outside conrad is entirely speculative he tells the story almost in absence of mind he will bring you right up to a moment of almost unendurable dramatic intensity and then devote half a dozen pages to depicting the psychological phenomena attendant upon it we who are gathered here consider the labor justified by the unique results the red-blooded folk whose conception of drama is as rudimentary as the struggle to enter a crowded subway train are naively infuriated when deprived of their precious story there are classes of novel readers who will not have conrad at any price they lack patience and are not compensated by any perfection of prose diction which may inadvertently come under their notice for them the donkeyman the carpenter and storekeeper mentioned earlier in this essay were simply taciturn nonentities 
for us they are a bizarre trinity of lonely souls floating in mysterious proximity through a universe of ironic destinies for us there are the indistinct shadows of men like axel haste captain mcguire and fall the present writer feels a special debt of gratitude for these notes on life and letters since they include a number of fugitive pieces occasional contributions to reviews which he missed at the time owing to being in some distant harbor there is the very indignant digression for example upon the loss of the titanic and it is worthy of note that when he deigns to speak of his contemporaries conrad is exasperatingly unaware of the existence of the gods in the best-selling universe he has much to say on the contrary of henry james of dostoevsky and of anatole france these articles are exactly what one would expect from the author urbane and dignified criticism of one artist by another conrad has been honored similarly by h g wells whose review of almayer's folly and an outcast of the islands is a masterpiece of critical insight yet one returns again to the prefaces one has here the feeling of being shown round the studio by the master this he seems to say is exactly how it was done he deprecates gently and one hopes sincerely the formidable accretion of legendary romanticism which has collected about his career we are to believe that these people in his books never actually existed they are the magnificent fabrications of the author's brain a head here a whispered conversation there a newspaper yarn over yonder and lo fifteen years later william or falk or Razumov or nostromo emerges from obscurity and assumes an enigmatic attitude of having existed since the dawn of time this will be very disappointing to those prosaic enthusiasts who like to hear that all great characters in fiction have their originals in history and the present writer must confess he had weakly imagined that the secret agent was the happy result of a long past familiarity with the strange folk who hang around legations and live in disreputable lodgings off greek street or the boxhall bridge road and yet of what avail are these prying speculations there seems still to survive in us much of that ghoulish predilection of the middle ages for relics we will go to a museum to look with veneration upon the authentic trinkets of the illustrious dead so in these notes on my books one must resist the temptation to linger over the personal revelations with vulgar curiosity they are for our information and comfort but they hold no anodyne for pain or elixir of youth whereby we may regain our lost illusions they must in no case divert our attention from one preface in particular a preface set apart by virtue of its history and intention it would be much more just to call it the confession of faith of a supreme master of prose the present writer is unable to speak of it without emotion it enshrines in resonant and perfect phrases the secret convictions of his heart it is the crowning gift of a great artist and when one pauses to condense in a few words an adequate comprehension of that artist's work one turns instinctively to this long suppressed preface to the nigger of the narcissus as one reads one recalls the literary art he says must strenuously aspire to the plasticity of sculpture to the colour of painting and to the magic suggestiveness of music which is the art of arts and it is only through complete unswerving devotion to the perfect blending of form and substance it is only through an unremitting never discouraged care for the shape and ring of sentence that an approach can be made for plasticity to colour and that the light of magic suggestiveness may be brought to play for an evanescent instant over the commonplace surface of words of the old old words worn thin defaced by ages of careless usage and again of the writer he speaks to our capacity for delight and wonder 
to the sense of mystery surrounding our lives to our sense of pity and beauty and pain to the latent feeling of fellowship with all creation and to the subtle but invincible conviction of solidarity that knits together the loneliness of innumerable hearts to the solidarity in dreams in joy in sorrow in aspiration in the illusions in hope in fear which binds men to each other which binds together all humanity the dead to the living and the living to the unborn so he sums it up beyond this in placing the bounds of the author's art it is impossible to go one is permitted only to add for the purpose of supplying a fitting conclusion the final paragraph the humble and industrious among us may smile incredulously yet toil on with a better heart when they read that our aim should be to arrest for the space of a breath the hands busy about the work of the earth and compel men entranced by the sight of distant goals to glance for a moment at the surrounding vision of form and color of sunshine and shadows to make them pause for a look for a sigh for a smile such is the aim difficult and evanescent and reserved only for a very few to achieve but sometimes by the deserving and the fortunate even that task is accomplished and when it is accomplished behold all the truth of life is there a moment of vision a sigh a smile and the return to an eternal rest End of the sea and conrad by william mcphee that where the invisible is seen the uncreated is created from the vision of god by nicholas of cusa fourteen hundred and one to fourteen hundred and sixty four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org crown of my joy and happiness thou hast appeared unto me sometimes as invisible from every creature because thou art a god secret and hidden and infinite and infinite is incomprehensible by any manner of comprehension then thou appearest to me as visible to all things for everything is so far forth as thou seest it and that could not be in act except it did see thee for vision gives being because it is thy essence so thou my god art visible and invisible thou art invisible as thou art and thou art visible as the creature is which so far forth is as it sees thee by everything that sees in everything that may be seen and in every act of seeing art thou seen which art invisible and absolute and free from all such things and infinitely super exalted therefore o lord i must leap over the wall of invisible vision where thou art found and the wall is all things and nothing both together and thou which meetest or appearest to us as though thou wert all things and nothing at all both together dwelleth within that high wall which no wit can by its own power ever be able to climb sometimes thou appearest unto me so that i imagine thou seest all things in thyself like a living glass in which all things shine and because thy seeing is thy knowing then it comes into my mind that thou dost not see also things in thyself as in a living glass for then thy knowledge shouldest arise from the things sometimes thou presenteth thyself to me that thou seest all things in thyself as power or virtue by looking upon itself as the power or possibility of the seed of a tree if it should look into and behold itself would in itself see the tree in power because the virtue of the seed is potentially the tree 
and then again me thinkest that thou dost not see thyself and all things in thyself as power or possibility for to see a tree in the power of the virtue differs from that vision by which the tree is seen in act and then i find how thy infinite virtue or power is beyond all specular and seminal virtue and beyond the coincidence radiation or reflection of the cause and also the thing caused and that that absolute virtue is absolute vision which is perfection itself above all manner of seeing for all the manners which explain the perfection of seeing are without any manners thy vision which is thy essence o oh my god but suffer most merciful lord that i thy wild creature may yet speak unto thee if thy seeing be thy creating and thou seest nothing but thyself but thyself art the object of thyself for thou art both the thing seen and the things seen and the act of seeing how then dost thou create other things from thee for thou seest to create thyself as thou seest thyself but thou comfortest me o life of my spirit for although i meet with the wall of absurdity which is of the coincidence of creating and being created as though it were impossible that creating and being created should coincide for to admit this seemest to be as if thou should affirm that a thing is before it is for when it creates it is and because it is created it is not yet it hinders not for thy creating is thy being neither is it any other thing at once to create and to be created than to communicate thy being unto all things that thou mayest be all things in all things and yet remain absolute from all things for to call to being things that are not is to communicate being to nothing so to call is to create to communicate is to be created and beyond this coincidence of creating and being created art thou god absolute and innate neither creating nor impossibility of being created although they are all that they are because thou art o thou heights of riches how incomprehensible thou art as long as i conceive a creator creating i am yet on this side the wall of paradise so as long as i conceive a creator in possibility of being created i have not entered but am in the wall but when i see thee as absolute infinite whereunto neither the name of a creator creating nor of a creator in possibility of being created can agree then i begin to see thee revealedly and to enter into the garden of delights because thou art no such thing as can be said or conceived but infinitely and absolutely super exalted above all such things thou art not therefore only a creator but infinitely more than a creator though without thee nothing is done or can be done to thee be praise and glory for ever and ever amen end of that where the invisible is seen the uncreated is created from the vision of god by nicholas of cusa fourteen o one to fourteen sixty four Unprofessional Forestry by Austin Carey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It ought to be a source of satisfaction to foresters when they find the work they have at heart going on outside the range of their knowledge and immediate assistance. 
when simple business interest dictates careful and conservative management on the part of forest owners, and this fact is clearly recognised, then, indeed, the cause is won. Just when the measures that embody it shall be, and just who are the best men to carry it into effect are matters that may be safely left for settlement by trial and time. The Canadian maritime provinces afford many examples of such unprofessional forestry. In that region are numerous forest properties that have been cut over for many years and yet retain their growing power and value. A moist climate and a law-abiding population have secured considerable exemption from fire. Logging methods conservative of the forest have been employed. The temper of the owners has not been such as to force timber ruthlessly on the market. As a general thing, only trees of good size have been cut, an amount of lumber frequently within the power of the lands to produce. That this policy has been a good one for all concerned would seem indisputable. The people and operators have done well, and the lands, in spite of fifty years of cutting, are more valuable at the present time than ever before. Some of these properties are handled today as nearly according to the principles of true forestry as is practicable. An illustration of such methods was encountered by the senior class in forestry at Harvard University on its trip among the lumber camps last winter. The Hollingsworth and Whitney Company of Boston, whose mills are at Waterville, Maine, is one of the largest paper manufacturing establishments of New England. This company, some ten years ago, began a policy of land purchase, which it has consistently carried on until, at the present time, it owns 100,000 acres of spruce land on the Kennebee River. This land they have operated carefully, intending to make it a permanent source of raw material for their mills. They tried logging by contract at first, but finding that the work was not done to suit them, bought teams and developed an organisation of their own. This organisation is fairly started now, and while methods of work are not yet perfected as they will be, enough has been done to demonstrate the intention of the company and to furnish considerable insight into the best methods of controlling such work. The principle of conservative cutting was adopted at the start, and is exemplified by the high size limit adopted as a general rule for cutting, namely 12 inches in diameter, breast height. Next, the company early determined to mark the timber for cutting. This presents no obstacles in the way of cost. Two or three cents per metre will cover that, but it does take determination on the part of the company, and it does mean thoroughgoing superintendence on the part of its responsible representatives to make logging bosses and choppers adhere to it. That it can be done, however, the experience of this company proves, and, as is so often the case with reforms of this kind, carried out in the face of strong opposition, Former objectors, since they have got used to the new method, rather like it than otherwise. The company's lands, to be sure, were of such character as to lend themselves to conservative cutting. It may, therefore, be safely said that, as far as the work has gone, a favourable result has been reached. Economy in the utilisation of the timber cut was, of course, the first thing looked after in the work of such a practical business like men. Saws are used instead of the axe in cutting down and cutting off. All dead and down stuff in the territory cut over that remains sound is picked up as a matter of course. Logs are run up into the tops of trees as far as the wood can be used in the mill. Stumps are cut low enough to put to shame the standard of some much lauded examples of forestry elsewhere. A little trick used to secure economy in the latter direction is well worth noting. The trees to be cut are marked not on the trunk but at the base, at a height just above that at which the stump should be cut. The choppers then are required to take the spot off with the log, a very simple and conclusive evidence of good work.
it would be strange if in the course of only three or four years a large organization doing work of this nature should have come to a state of efficiency which could be desired or which with time and effort will be attained habitually in kenneby logging two horses and a sled four feet wide for yarding purposes are employed a type of rig which necessitates a wide road and a good deal of destruction of small trees much of the country and timber of h and w co appears to be adapted to the adirondack method of yarding with a single horse trailing or snaking one or two logs directly on the ground the company is aware of the saving of growth by the latter method and as soon as it can be done under favourable conditions will give it a thorough trial the final decision between the two will depend on ratio of saving to expense another point in which the work of the company may be criticised with a show of reason is that its method of cutting is too rigidly uniform it does not allow sufficient variation to meet the needs of the case the territory is in general well adapted to conservative cutting but there are directions in which the present system does not meet the full requirements of the case a good deal of fur below size limits standing on the ground will surely go to waste if it is left for the next cutting then there are places where the land had better be cut clean and other places where scattering of trees merchantable size had better be left to stand either on account of expense or for the sake of young growth around them the present practice of the company is perhaps best for the present all things considered but there can be no doubt that in the near future it should be changed possibly such change will require the better class of men shall do the marking than those now employed though the points involved are neither many nor different lastly there is the matter of destroying small growth in felling trees in swamping roads and similar operations change in the yarding method would do much to relieve that but outside of this measure reform is difficult matter involving training of the woodsmen and if possible more permanency in the woods force how much can be done in this direction is uncertain the statements above cover the main points involved in the system of conservative cutting but there is one other achievement of the h and w company which is well worthy of note like every other man and corporation doing business on the main rivers though not all like them have been aware of the fact they have been sufferers from the peculiarities of construction and from the tricks in manipulation of the common board rule with the business in their own hands from the stump to the mill they did not have to remain subservient to the custom of the region in which they operated they have in fact gone back to first principles and devised a rule of their own which gives the actual contents of the logs in cubic feet from measured length and middle diameter a measure like that discounted for bark as careful studies have shown them should be done gives exactly the information about its logs the company requires when they are to be used in pulp and paper manufacture a few general reflections which seem to be worthy of note are suggested in this connection the first is that work of just the nature here outlined is under the circumstances of the case real forestry that admitted it is instructed for one thing to note what kind of men have been instrumental in bringing success about william lanagan the head of the land business of the company is an old kenneby lumberman and log driver one of those forcible and clear-headed men without much schooling so common in all lines of american business for a woodman he is more than ordinary thoughtfulness and hospitality to new ideas his time is spent mainly outside the woods directing logging operations only in a large way keeping in touch with the business both inside and outside his own concern he is the man who devised the system of mountain watch stations connected by telephone with the wardens below which proved so efficient in preventing forest fires on the upper kenneby last year under him come the walking bosses so called men who have general charge of a section of the company's wood operations lewis oakes 
who has charge of the eight or ten camps east of Moosehead Lake, is a land surveyor by training who has been familiar with timber and logging since boyhood, and, while he may never have chopped or run a camp himself, he knows perfectly well how it ought to be done. He looks out the location of the camps and main roads in summer, and, after logging begins, he sees to it that the camps are stocked with tools, supplies and men, giving advice, settling disputes and in general keeping things in a smooth running order. Camp foremen are an important item in this organisation. These men are of the usual type and training, though a sifting process is constantly going on for the best and most efficient. The workmen, too, are like those found in other corners of the region, many of them French Canadians. Nothing perhaps to secure the best work either need or can be done with them except to organise and watch their work and use them liberally in the matters of food, quarters and pay. The marking is done by bright young woodsmen who are paid about the wages of a cook or foreman. One man in the course of three months in the fall will mark all the timber that two or three camps will cut all winter. Here, if anywhere, in the matters of marking and inspection of logging work, is the weak place in the company system. The work of the Hollingworth and Whitney Co. is believed by the writer to come very close to securing true forestry, as near certainly as any logging work carried on in the spruce woods of New England, and yet it is seen that in the company's organisation there is no man of technical forestry training, no man who even calls himself a forester. That suggests to the mind of the writer that perhaps we who assume the professional name may, in our enthusiasm and eagerness, have valued our own usefulness and efficiency too highly. While we have been theorising about forest management and drawing up plans which may or may not have some effect on the lands to which they are applied, other men in their own territory have been going ahead without advertisement or parade, actually securing the real thing. The idea is worth pondering, and the question that follows it, whether it is not they rather than we who are the real foresters of this country. The writer believes that there is much truth in this suggestion, yet further reflection will show that neither forestry educators nor technically trained men need to depreciate their services in the past, nor feel discouragement over future prospects. It is true in the first place that any attempt at conservative lumbering, such as for instance as that described, is not altogether self-developed or self-maintained. In a measure, the way in which they have gone to work, and in still greater degree the fundamental attitude of the Hollingsworth and Whitney Co. towards the timberland tributary to their mills are very largely the fruit of literature with which the country for the last 20 years has been thickly sown. Business permanence as dependence on the woods, the forest as a field, not a mine, the time element in the production of timber crops, the essential value of reproduction, the achievements of forestry in Europe. These ideas, propagated through forestry literature, are behind every attempt at better forest management today, and nothing has been or is more necessary than their propagation. In regard to future management and the school trained man, there is just one thing to be said, but that is full of meaning and cuts in a multitude of ways. It is that when technically trained men can do the work required better than those who are now conducting it, they will get it to do. End of Unprofessional Forestry by Austin Carey Read by Melanie T